Well, thank you, Governor, for those encouraging remarks and again for joining us today. Let's give him uh, another round of applause. Welcome to part two of this portion of the summit, uh, which is titled One Ring to Rule Them All, How Centralized Power is Corrupting Our Institutions, Increasing Polarization, and Undermining Elections. My name is Jeff Vanderslice, and I am the Director of Federal Government Affairs uh, here at the R Street Institute. And I am uh, pleased and uh, thrilled to introduce to you all our three panelists uh, for this discussion, who together bring a, a, a real wealth of knowledge uh, and experience when it comes to uh, this panel's discussion on elections. Uh, the Honorable Trey Grayson previously served two terms as Kentucky's Secretary of State, uh, and during that time as Chair of the Republican Association of Secretaries of State and as President of the National Association of Secretaries of State. He has also served as the director of Harvard University's Institute of Politics and has served on the Bipartisan Presidential Commission on Election Administration. Scott Warren is a fellow at the SNF Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins University, uh, where he teaches courses and who, along with the R Street Institute, is co-leading an initiative focused on exploring, researching, and convening a pro-democracy conservative agenda in the United States, which we'll be hearing uh, quite a bit about during today's discussion. And then, of course, last but certainly not least is our own Matt Germer, uh, who is resident elections fellow and the interim director of governance program here at the R Street Institute. So welcome, all of you. So I'd like to uh, kick off today's discussion by first turning to you, Scott, if I may, uh, with the hope that you can tell us a bit more about uh, the, the Agora R Street convenings that I just referenced uh, a moment ago. Uh, and, and more specifically, how did this project uh, initially come about and how has it developed over time? Uh, thanks so much, and it's, it's great to be here. Um, R Street does tremendous work. We've been privileged to be partnering with them. Uh, for, for the last year. And uh, the SNF Agora Institute, uh, where I, I work as a, as a fellow, um, we're all about strengthening global democracy um, through really trying to, to bridge that research practice divide um, and, and bring folks together to have conversations like we're having here. Uh, how this really started, because I think it's relevant to, to the conversation at hand, is um, about a year and a half ago, we we're having conversations about the fractitious quote unquote democracy reform field and how there weren't really uh, candid conversations about what was working and, and what wasn't. Um, so we got a group of about 40 folks together. Um, off the record, we had um, some elected officials, we had some secretaries of state, we had some advocates, we had think tank uh, representatives from, from groups like R Street. Uh, really good, robust, rich conversation for, for two days. Uh, and then a few folks from R Street, from AEI came up to me after and said, this was a great conversation, but as with all democracy conversations, about 90% were from folks on the left. 90% uh, of the representatives were, were progressives. What would it mean to have a conversation like this with folks on the right, with conservatives, uh, to put together their own uh, agenda for democracy and their own agenda for building up trust in, in elections? Um, and that led to uh, really a, a test and about a year ago, uh, along with, with Jonathan Bidlack, who used to be at R Street, um, we put together a convening in DC, again, off the record, but all folks on the right, conservatives, to sort of explore this question of what would it mean to actually put together uh, a conservative agenda for democracy. And there have been robust conversations, and we can talk about this, I think there's been um, a, a lot of potential and uh, the off-the-record nature of it has been important. Uh, we've had subsequent conversations in Utah, uh, in Indianapolis, in Texas. Uh, we have one in D.C. coming up that we can talk on. Uh, and we all, we're also engaging in some research and, and so we're doing some polling with Gallup to figure out who are the messages and messengers that, that resonate um, with conservatives as it pertains to, to election trust. I think the last thing I'll say on this that's been really important, um, and, and, and um, Matt and Trey can, can talk on this, we've been trying to figure out how do we put together a, a proactive 
um, affirming agenda for trust in elections and for democracy for conservatives. And I think we've made some headway there, um, but really trying to figure out how do we generate ideas and put something forward and start with candid conversations uh, behind the scenes that can actually lead to something um, on the record too. And I understand that, uh, is, is it next month we should expect to see uh, something uh, initially come out of this? Or, or what, what, what would you ultimately like to see in terms of a, a, a perhaps a produced product? I understand that it's currently off the record, uh, but, but will it culminate in something eventually? That's, that's the hope. And, and Matt, well, I'll turn it over to Matt to talk <laughs> on this. Um, because what we're trying to do is, is to get um, you know, sort of more of the, the decision makers on the right, election officials, uh, secretaries of state, to affirm um, the importance of trusting in elections. I think it goes to the theme of what we're talking about today. How do we build trust in institutions? How can they, for example, we've had conversations with secretaries that might say, well, we know that elections in our state are good, but we don't know about uh, elections in other states. That's not the most useful framing for a whole host of reasons. Even if you do have distrust about what happens in other states, you can sort of keep that to yourself. So I think what we're aiming to do is, is can we uh, have some conversations with these folks where they make, um, where they affirm principles that, that we're literally building up. I don't know if you want to you yeah, say more. Yeah, and I'm that. happy to jump in on that. And thanks to R Street, my employer, for having me here. It's always great. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, I've, been, I've been privileged to be a part of this process as well. I, I've been to each of the convenings, um, uh, in DC, Utah, Indianapolis, Unfortunately, missed the Texas one recently. Um, I'm very, very excited for our next round in DC. Um, one thing that we are looking to bring forward, as, as Scott mentioned, are those principles. What are things that conservative leaders across the country can all stand together and say, these are things that we are willing to affirm and live out? Um, and, and as Scott referenced, one of, those, one of those problems that we identified in the course of uh, these convenings is how difficult it can be uh, for conserv local conservative leaders, which is largely where these convenings have been focused. Uh, it, we've had folks all, from county and, and municipal levels up to, to statewide. Uh, our very first convening, we had a few folks more at the national level, but generally speaking, it's been much more focused at the state, and that's because local government and local government officials are more trusted by Americans, um, especially when it comes to questions around elections, election process, and, and really faith in our democracy. Uh, and so we see a real opportunity there in providing uh, resources and tools to those officials to be able to stand up and say, your local elections are secure. And I think most Americans abide by that. Uh, what's frustrating at the moment is, is something about, a the AP just released a poll um, showing that I believe only 44% of Americans have substantial confidence that the 2024 election will be counted properly uh, and accurately. Um, and, then, and the bulk of that distrust is coming from the right. Uh, I think something around 22% of Republican voters expressed that high confidence in the outcome of the 2024 election. Um, regardless of who ends up winning, I expect there to be further shifting uh, in that uh, confidence level in 2024. All indication at the moment is that that election is going to be very contentious, featuring names and faces that we all know well. Uh, and there's no reason to, in my mind to believe that uh, uh, we will wake up in late or you know, mid-November in 2024 or January in 2025 and have the entire American culture suddenly flipped on its head with robust you know, outpourings of support, faith, and trust in our elections. Uh, and that means that there's a real crisis on our hands uh, to deal with. And particularly, again, I would say for local conservative uh, uh, leaders, whether that's elected officials and, and election administrators, uh, but also just folks who have influence over their local communities. Um, so we are putting together those, uh, uh, those points to help guide in a direction to build toward uh, trust in elections to take the, the, the trust that is built at that local level and say, look, we have great security practices locally. Almost all of those security practices are in place across the rest of the country. Um, you don't have to necessarily endorse every single elections policy across the country. I think that would be foolish to expect something like that and honestly unwise because there are some elections policies that should be uh, improved in jurisdictions across the country over time. Uh, but to say that, that it's very difficult to steal an election anywhere in this country is a true statement. Uh, that in, in uh, elections offices all across the country, votes are counted under the laws of that state as, ex as they exist uh, at the time of the election. We can squabble over what those laws should be, but once they're in place, once the election t takes place, we should feel confident in the outcomes. Um, so that's largely where we're focused. I think in November, we're going to be exploring those a little bit further with our group. Again, to a point Scott and Jeff have both brought up, one of the most exciting parts of this is that we have been leaning 
uh, on the off the record nature of these conversations and on kind of a Chatham House rule. You know, we can we can talk about what's been going on there without um, uh, disclosing too much. And because of that, we've had wonderful candor from our participants who are um, willing to, to express and share stories from what has worked well for them, where their struggles have been, and to, to connect across the room as folks from around the country recognize that they're not alone uh, as conservative leaders in their communities to say, I've also gone through that experience. Let me tell you about what's worked for me. You should give this a shot. So a little bit more. You know, Scott mentioned that uh, the first convening, which I helped to plan, but I couldn't go to, but I'm usually in that 10%. You know, I'm the 10% that's on the right that's in a convening with a bunch of lefties, and they provide, you know, I'm 6'5", so I guess I can't be <laughs> twice, maybe, you know, to provide balance. Um, but I always find it frustrating that there aren't a lot of, there, there historically have not been a lot of groups on the right that were coming at this to try to make elections work better, to try to build confidence in elections too often. Some of the activism on the right in the election space is about you know, it's about winning an election, not running elections better. And so I think there was there's we've tapped into a real hunger in this space. Um, I've been to I went to the the one in D.C. with the, the kind of the original conservative convening, and it was great. I mean, we had people from all across the country, people who didn't always agree. You know, we're all of the right, but we didn't necessarily agree on other issues, mm -hmm. and maybe didn't even agree on sort of what a democracy agenda might look like from the right. Um, on sort of, you know, on everything. Uh, but it was, it was a great conversation. And then the Utah, uh, the Utah convening, which I also went to, was fascinating because we were, you know, Utahans actually have a fairly high trust level in elections. Uh, and it's a pretty Republican, pretty right of center state. And obviously there's the role of the church in Utah. And so you, that, you can't ignore that, but it's got to be more than that. And so one of the things we tried to explore is what is it about Utah and its systems uh, that seem to produce more trust in elections and what can be exported. And then out of that conversation was the, was the interest in getting some Secretary of States together, because there were a couple of secretaries who said, you know, it'd be nice to get a group of us together, just the Republicans and just some of the Republicans who we think would be interested in this conversation in a safe space. Um, over the last few years, so when I was president of the Secretary of States Association, we were a really collegial body. You know, one of my best friends was my predecessor who was a, the Democrat. Uh, and same with the successor, we got along pretty well. Now, some of the you might argue is because we were milk toasty and didn't get, weigh in on controversial things as an organization. Uh, it was also the Stone Ages. The, the, the election politics in 2000 are so different and so much easier and quaint. Even it wasn't easy back then when you were in the middle of it, but compared to today, it's easier. Uh, but still, even up into the last few years, the NAS was the most collegial of the statewide bodies of the constitutional officers, and it's tough now. Uh, it's tough because of the fallout from the 2020 election. It's tough because um, the Democrats have more money in elections for secretaries of state, and they use that money to beat up Republican candidates. And so you just get some hurt feelings. That's natural, you know. Um, but and so there was, we were able to you know get some folks together to have have conversations about how we could, you know, what are some of the policies we could look. And I think we could talk about some of those policies mm -hmm. without violating you know some of the Chatham House rules, but. It was just refreshing to be in those kinds of groups. I couldn't go to Texas, but one of the colleagues at my law firm, a former legislator from Texas, he was there and had a great experience. And unfortunately, in Kentucky, we actually have a really big election this year. And the November convening is a direct conflict with the Kentucky gubernatorial election. So I got to be back in Kentucky, so I won't be able to go. But I'm sure it'll be, um, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes from it. Uh, so yes, absolutely, we will get into a, a policy discussion a, a, a bit in just a moment. Um, but first, I have a sort of a two-part question. How did you decide who to invite to these convenings? Um, and did you look for other, you know, explicitly like-minded individuals? Or did you look for some diversity of thought, maybe diversity of, 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 uh, of geography? Or what were some of the criteria that you looked to? I mean, I think, I think the way that we thought about it was, um, I mean, one, folks that that, that are conservative and, and have conservative credentials and, and believe in, in conservative principles, and two are gonna operate in good faith. Right. Um, I think that, that that's where we've, we want folks in the room that don't necessarily agree with each other, but we know that are going to essentially abide by democratic principles within the confines of the own convenient, right? And so there's, there's some subjectivity in terms of who that actually entails, but I think we've done uh, you know, a decent job um, building that up. There, there, not all of the conversations have been, um, you know, uh, 
they, they've been cordial, but there's been disagreement and there's been debate and there's been discussion and there's been tension. And I think that that's, that's a good thing because what we're trying to solve for, how to, how to rebuild trust in elections and, and how to ultimately have a conservative agenda for democracy is not an easy thing to do. Um, so but we want folks that are dedicated to that. And we have looked for, for folks, um, you know, as, as, <clears throat> as Matt said, We've gone a little deeper on, on thinking about um, local actors here, but we've had a diversity in terms of um, really profession and, and where folks come in the room. So we've had election administrators, um, we've had um, uh, you know local policymakers. Um, we, we've tried to do a thing where we faith, faith leaders. Faith leaders, yeah, yep. we've had faith leaders. Well, one of the things that I think is important too is we're trying to figure out who are who are messengers that actually can relate and instill trust. Uh, uh, amongst the electorate. And so um, we've played around with that and it's not meant to be sort of a, you know, a closed door, like only folks that have come in can stay in type thing. We, we ultimately want this to be a community of, of folks. And so it is the type of thing where if people here are interested and want to participate in future convenings. We, we want that. I think the off the record nature has been important to start the conversation and to the point of people operating in good faith. Um, we want people to be comfortable saying, you know, I'm not sure if I think that what happened in this election was real. I'm not sure I agree with, with that person, or I'm worried about this thing that's happening in elections and, and not be afraid that that's gonna, that's gonna be public too. And that, I'll note that that particular diversity has allowed for healthy conversations, uh, dispelling myths, for example. We've, we've had uh, conversations at, at one of these convenings around, um, I heard in such and such state uh, that there is some funny business going on, and it's helpful to have folks in the room who either were there uh, and, and are familiar with the details of those conversations. And again, because it's off the record, they're, they're able to explore uh, what their doubts were, or either that or able to back up uh, what actually happened without fear of necessarily getting hammered uh, in the media for uh, asking questions in good faith. I think, I think the metaphor we've often been using is we need folks who can play well with each other in the sandbox and who aren't throwing fistfuls of sands at each other. And if that's the case, they don't need to agree on every single issue. And I think we might end up getting into some of the policy around this, but there was quite a bit of disagreement about policy within each convening we've held, and quite a bit of disagreement as we've traveled around the country, uh, really uh, accentuating that what works for, for one group of people uh, might work for another group of people. It's worth exploring, but it's not guaranteed to. And a big part of this process is figuring out uh, where those differences lie, but also where we have similarities, uh, higher level things that we can all come together and agree on. Well, if I, I could, one thing is from an elected official standpoint, as a former elected official, it's really hard to be, I was actually talking uh, with Soren uh, Dayton, we were talking about the speaker vote, Jordan once again didn't get the votes to become the House Speaker and actually did a little bit worse. And just sort of the dilemma of the Republican elected official who, who you know, wants to do the right thing, sees what's going on, wants to get reelected, um, worries if you do something wrong that a crazy person would succeed you and so maybe you gotta sacrifice a little bit. And that dilemma, it's easier to hash that out and also to share stories about how people hash that out mm -hmm. when, when, when the elected officials are in that uh, safe space. And then the hope is that then they can go back home with their ideas, and particularly with the secretaries. There were some different approaches that I thought some of the secretaries like, oh yeah, I should try that in my state. I think that would really help. Um, and so that was another aspect of, um, I think, the value of the convenings. That's great. When it comes to these convenings, I think you've, you've touched on all of these aspects uh, to a certain extent, but to what extent are these convenings or, or, or what you hope to get out of these convenings about policy versus settling on, let's say, a set of principles versus maybe it's just all about the need for better messaging and education of officials and the public and, and so forth. And, and how, do you, how do you see that all sort of working with one another? I, I'll start, I'm curious to get the perspective. I mean, part of it is I think everybody might have a different perspective and I think that that's, that's <laughs> important and valid in its own right. I, I think that the way that we might think about this or I might think about this is, um, there's, I mean, there's, there's so many, and, and the last panel was talking about this, but there's, there's so many challenges um, pertaining to, um, I mean, what is it? you know, sort of even the, the challenges of democracy itself is such a broad topic, right? We, we got into this a little in Texas, is a, and like, how much of, are we thinking about this as a, a problem in trust in elections versus a problem in able to actually dialogue with each other and our fellow citizens and, and to say nothing of sort of, um, you know, faith in, in institutions beyond elections, right? There's, there's so much that has to be done. Um, and this has been one of the tensions, I think, in the convenings is how much is about the right now versus how much is about a broader agenda. 
To that point, though, I do think that trying to figure out what is an agenda that builds trust in elections right now in advance of 24 is the best way to get to that broader, more holistic, more comprehensive agenda for democracy in the long term. And I do think, um, <clears throat> You know, it seems like that the, the left has sort of co-opted the democracy agenda in ways that I don't think has to happen. And so I think that this is the first start in terms of in terms of the right being able to say, here's our own agenda. Then in terms of trust in elections, I think, and this is, I mean, Trey and, 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 and Matt Chuan, it really has been a mix of what are policies and concrete policies that, that can be put forth whether it's pre-processing, whether it's audits, whether it's it's no excuse mail-in, whether it's it's voter ID, of course, um, and who are the messages and what are the messenger who are the messengers and what are the messages that are going to resonate? Because if you have policies and no one understands what they're doing, then then what does that what does that mean? But I'm curious to get. Yeah, I, I'll I'll mention that I think from my point of view, the the nature and the goal of these meetings has shifted a bit as to, as we've had them and as we recognize what kind of power they provide. Uh, I think very early on. It was a, like when we talk about what is a conservative agenda for democracy, um, that really was like, what could be like a policy package and a legislative agenda that we could go forward and say, these are all the things that every state should have, which was a great question to have, I think, in, in the summer and into the fall of 2022. Uh, political circumstances were just different. And I think people had a different view of what the 24 election might look like. Um, and, and in particular, we, we hosted I think, our first one in October, October. Mm -hmm. of 22. Mm -hmm. um, by the time we hosted our next one uh, in Utah, it was April of 23. And political circumstances had changed pretty dramatically. Uh, and I think along the way, one of the, op the opportunities for this group went from, well, let's pass all these bills in a variety of states to, we got some work to do on just the basics of trust in our elections uh, and in um, reinforcing the good practices that already exist in all of these states. Um, and the number of times that we were, we were hashing out different policy options uh, uh, and local state election officials would say, or, or county election officials would say, we, we already do these things. We might have this conversation about paper ballots and you look around, you're like, almost every single state has mm -hmm. robust paper records of votes. And if you wanted to go back and hand count them, you could, It'd take you a very long time, but you could. Um, and and at, at a certain point, it was, it, it's, it's still the, the legislative policy prescriptions are part of the conversation, but it's not the entirety of the conversation. The, I guess the other point I'd, I'd point out is in the value of these convenings, uh, you might have picked up on it the way that we've talked about it, but the, um, the network building and relationship building that has occurred as a result of these, uh, it, it's hard to quantify. Uh, it's hard to go back and say, you know, it, it's, not, it's not as flashy as, you know, we endorsed a bill and the bill got passed, but instead it's, um, one of the participants in, in the meeting was expressing a desire for uh, more local community leaders to, to create community organizations where conservatives can, can feel in the, in the current environment like there are other conservatives out there who are kind of frustrated by the way things are going, a life raft uh, of others they can, they can get along with. And one of our participants went forward basically and created that in their own locality. Uh, and it was because of conversations that happened at our convenings. And so it's hard to go back and point to those necessarily, again, because of like the off the record nature of what we're doing and the rest. But to me, there's a real um, power in that kind of output as well that won't always be reflected by a set of policy principles uh, or the rest. Yeah, you know, the Secretary of State convening was obviously a little bit different because it was literally just um, Republican secretaries, plus I was the facilitator and then we had uh, two other Republicans in the room who were, one was a former, another former secretary and the other was a kind of a prominent, it was a policy expert on, on the right from, and so that one was a little bit more about, you know, sharing best practices, helping each other out. And also there's a bunch of new secretaries. So, you know, how do you govern in this environment? How do you, you know, handle all that? And so building those relationships was a real, that one was a real absolute stated goal. I, I think one of the things, I don't think we've said this yet, but one of the, themes that, um, you know, what we're trying to do is to build confidence. And one of the themes that I thought emerged and a lot of the policy ideas kind of went under was trying to get accurate election results sooner. So how do you, you know, how do you get the results out sooner? Because one of the things that we've observed, I think, in these conversations, and a lot of people observed, is that the longer, the longer it takes to find out who won, that's when people, of really both parties, start to, like, wonder is the other side cheating? Are there shenanigans going on? And so how do we get results sooner? Now, one of the ways is to have larger margins. You know, in the elections administration space, we always joke about the election administrator prayer the night before the election is that it's a blowout. 
because while you know Arizona and California might still be counting a lot of their ballots a long time, and Ohio looks done. Ohio's only done because they, you know, the Republican won by 10 points. They're still counting votes. Um, and so, but there are things you could do to count votes quicker. You know, we could make sure that every state in America allowed mail-in ballots to be pre-processed, and, and that just is a law that ought to be passed. But if it, but if it's framed in the right way, and this is the other part of this, how do you take some of these principles and sell them to conservatives? And if you if you and one of the ways to do that is to use conservative messaging, conservative themes, conservative ideas, and conservative messengers. And so, it might be. Someone might say, well, I don't really like vote by mail. And personally, I don't really like vote by mail, but set that aside. And so I don't want to do anything to make it easier for people to vote by mail. But what if I said, if I don't allow pre-processing absentee ballots, results are going to be slower. And I value that as a conservative. I want results quicker. So I better, you know, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, some of these states that have historically not counted absentee ballots, processed absentee ballots early enough, so therefore they can't count the ballots quickly enough. Um, that puts a Republican argument like, oh yeah, we should do that. That's a dumb policy. Let's change that, because I, as a Republican, value that. Um, so, and and so, I, you know, how do you how do you address those policies? Same thing with like drop boxes. So if we don't have drop boxes, then people have to put it in the mail in the big blue drop box and put it in the big federal government's hands. And whether that you know who knows what's actually going on there, as opposed to literally putting it in your own drop box that maybe has a video camera on it. So let's put a video camera on that Dropbox. And that's the security argument. That again, is something we on the right care a lot about. And so you can sell some of these things to a more skeptical audience. Um, that's, I think, this intersectional policy and messaging uh, that I hope to come out of this. Mm -hmm. just, to, just to show that, I mean, <clears throat> I'm speaking on the record about this, but, but the nature of the author record, on the, on the Dropbox specifically, you did have policymakers that said, look, the evidence we know shows that cameras on top of Dropboxes don't make a difference, but we did this to instill trust in the electorate, which I think is fine, and I, and mm -hmm. I think that that goes, but, but I think that those are the, the, the bargains that can be talked about in sort of this, this space, which is, you know, we know that we're doing some things for the express purpose of trust, and that's going to be fine. Another thing that I think demonstrates the difference between policies and, and potentially some of these principles, there were a lot of local election officials that have talked about the importance of, uh, of transparency and really opening up, here's what we actually do, right? And sort of bringing people into the process. And what's interesting is um, we're doing focus groups and, and polling with Gallup, as I said, and we'll be releasing our, our first Gallup results um, at this November convening, but we did some focus groups in Wisconsin. In, in North Carolina, and, and you had folks that were saying, yeah, we just, we don't know, we hear things, we, you know, we hear from, from our friends, we hear from the news, and, and then there was someone in the focus group that was like, you know, I had those same concerns, and I'm a poll worker, and I saw everything, you know, actually from the inside, and now I trust elections, and the people, or I trust my elections, and the people in the focus group said, well, I trust Bill, which, which is an interesting, you know, just how do you actually ensure that those voices um, are, are amplified, and, I mean, this is also something that's come up. How do you get more people involved as poll workers? I mean, I think that that's actually something that, that you know, that a lot of these secretaries are struggling with of, we don't have enough people to actually work the polls or there are people that don't necessarily relate to everybody else. And so how can we figure that out too? I, I know that we got other questions, but no, I, I want to mention on that particular point, um, it's been clear to me that like, much as uh, in a variety of other ways in our culture, Americans like are consumers. And that is true for news media. It's true for media and, and our elections generally. The, the, our, our elections are here to, to be observed and argued about and uh, uh, a, a source of entertainment for far too many Americans, mm -hmm. um, where in reality, it really requires humans to step up and say, I'm going to help make this happen. You know, I think we've heard, like, democracy is not a spectator sport. Uh, and that's often used as, like, therefore, get out and vote. But in uh, far too many jurisdictions, it needs to be like, therefore, go volunteer, uh, because they are in dire need of, of people to actually uh, serve in that role. And by doing that, you are creating, to, to Scott's point, uh, like you, would now, you then gain that expertise so you can go and influence the rest of the folks in your life about why the elections are secure. Um, and so the next time that we don't host a convening on an election day, uh, I'm excited, I think, to start playing the role of, a, of an election poll worker. Yeah, I'm actually, uh, I mean, I, I, I do <laughs> political commentary in Kentucky. That's why I'm out there. But I am a poll worker now. I do the early voting on Saturday. And I decided I should start doing that in the primary. And it was a great experience. And I'm going to do it again. Uh, I've, got, I've got training Saturday. This is all, the, the people who were in there, like, who not everybody knew I was a former Secretary of State. And some of them who did thought it was really funny that I had to go through training mm -hmm. to go be a poll worker. <laughs> um, but I did. And I got paid, you know, like 15 bucks for my time. So there you go. <laughs> totally worth it. That's great. 
Uh, so we've touched briefly mm -hmm. on what is often the elephant in the room whenever we talk about trust in elections, which is that, uh, frankly, a lot of conservatives still have not uh, gotten on board with, with accepting the results of the 2020 election. Uh, so I guess my question is, in your view, do you, do you expect or suspect that conservatives are ready to move on from, from that election? I, I'll go first and see all the Thanks mind. for going first yeah. on that one, Matt. Um, <laughs> yes and no. I mean, like, some of it, to element, it depends on who you're talking to and, and um, what you mean by that question. I'm going to be the lawyer on this. It depends. Um, I think for, for most conservatives, uh, they aren't thinking about the 2020 election day to day. Their news media might be, their conservative news media might be focused on that quite a bit still. And the uh, various elected officials on the right still, uh, or formerly elected officials, uh, might still be very focused on the 2020 election. But I think for most people, they're, they're looking at their day-to-day -day lives, their own pressing concerns at the moment. Um, they're looking at their next opportunity in 2024 to make change on that front. Um, but that said, I think the vast majority of, of conservatives that I have come across and, and been um, in, in this kind of dialogue with at the least have concerns about the way 2020 was done, at the worst, express some element of despair about elections. That like they are inherently broken, they cannot be fixed, everything is rigged, uh, and our leaders are illegitimate. Um, that kind of despair scares me because it's our democracy, and I, we keep, for what it's worth, I feel like a small tangent. We have found, I think, as part of this experiment as well, uh, the word democracy has a bit of like a partisan coding into it. Uh, it is not an extremely popular word on the right, uh, mm -hmm. and I try not to use it. I have because we've, we've now said it a handful of times here on the panel, but um, big fan of words like self-government or our republic or any of the myriad other ways to describe the fact that the people are the ones empowering their leaders. But um, for the purposes of this discussion, we'll use democracy. So that, uh, uh, I think, it concerns me because democracy relies upon the consent of the losers. The winners have every incentive in the world to claim power and say, everyone bow down to us, we won. But you won't have a democracy unless the losers say, you're right, you did win, and we're going to fight you in the future so that we can then take control. Um, without that, we, we descend into anarchy and tribalist fighting, uh, and we lose what makes a democracy special. Um, so I am very concerned about the number of people I've come across that, that aren't ready to move on from 2020. Uh, and who have instead internalized it to mean that all elections are not trustworthy. But I think that, that group is vocal. I don't think they necessarily represent the majority uh, of conservatives or Republican voters, uh, but they are outsized. Uh, and I am nervous about the impact they can have depending on how 2024 goes. Because if it, once again, we, we get circumstances where people look around for uh, loud voices who are willing to offer them things that sound good, uh, there will be those loud voices willing to express uh, uh, distrust in the elections. Two, two follow-up points on that. One, um, I mean, I, I, we, we had one of the elections officials in Indianapolis basically say, I mean, this is to Matt's point, that there are some people that, that it doesn't matter what you tell them about the process if the outcome is not what they want it to be. And so you have a, you have a set of people that, that's like that. It's almost like we're not really, I mean, and this isn't sort of on the right or the left, but, but, I, but I think that, that you do have folks like that. So it is trying to instill trust in the people that are skeptical and skeptical for, for potentially good reasons. The second point, um, which is relevant to that, is that this is not just a problem on the right. I saw a poll recently where um, in advance of the 2020 election, if you, you asked liberals and conservatives whether they, um, they thought they were going to trust or they did trust elections, uh, I think you had 80 per, something like 80% of conservatives that trusted elections and about 50% of, um, of, of Democrats that did. And then that reversed after the election. Well, what changed? It was who won. And so I think this goes to the point where there's a sense in which you need to instill trust in the process. And there's a sense in which, um, I mean, this is a much bigger endeavor. Um, but how do you, um, how do you instill uh, trust in the process of loser's consent? Um, which is a, that, that, that's, that's a, a much hairier proposition. I mean, is, look, I don't even know. Have we said the word Trump yet on this panel? I guess I just did. Um, I mean, we're, as long as the most powerful figure in the Republican Party is an election denier, it's still an issue, period. Um, that being said, you know, in Kentucky, in our primary, our incumbent Secretary of State smashed an election denier in the primary. And it wasn't because um, Secretary Adams had a ton of money and smashed them. They had neither had much money. Mike obviously had better name recognition. 
Uh, but it just went to show that outside of that hard core, and, and if you went to the party events across the state, you might think that this election denier had a lot of, had a big chance. But when it actually got to the voters, um, he got he got swamped. Now, there's a lot of, you know, you look into 2022 Secretary of State primaries, and in most cases, the denier won in some of the competitive states, but then lost in the fall. So we blew the race by nominating the wrong candidate. And so there is, you know, as the senior senator from my state says, there is very little education in the second kick of a mule. Um, so I think we, we could learn something there. Uh, but as, like, we're in the, in the Trump era, and he's still obsessed by it. And our act, too many Republican activists are going to be obsessed by it. But that get, again gets back to those who are in office right now. How do we arm them with the policies and the tools to either fight back or pick the right battle that they can win and educate? I mean, again, I've seen this in Kentucky that our legislators they know the 2020 election wasn't stolen, but they get a lot of questions. And so, how can we help them understand the laws that they've passed that made Kentucky elections secure and why voters can have confidence and what has yet to be done that we can do? And so, you know, that's, that's, I think, part of this effort is, is, is giving the information, giving the policies to policy makers and policy activists uh, so that we can uh, overcome this challenge we've got. What role would you say that this distrust that we've, we've heard so much about at the federal level and, and particularly the, the, the last presidential election uh, plays when it comes to trust in local elections? I mean, survey after survey shows the most trusted level of government is the local level. And as I think Scott has said, the local election administrator, the local poll worker is the, is the trusted person. That's helpful in this debate because elections in almost every state except probably Louisiana are very, very decentralized. And even in Louisiana, you still have the poll workers at the local level. And so we do have this opportunity to use the facts of how we administer elections in America um, to try to, you know, grab onto that. Uh, there was also this notion of the, the using locals, another term that's often used is pillars. You know, where are these trusted institutions and that are at the local level? Um, it kind of reminds me of the old surveys, like, I don't like Congress, but I like my congressman. You know, why? Because that person you know a little bit. And I think in the elections world, we need to, to kind of focus back to the county clerk or recorder or supervisor, whatever they're called, and the poll workers and everybody else, and maybe that's how we can uh, build that trust up. So just because we were just in Texas, we were looking this up, and I think something like 80, 80 plus percent of Texan conservatives trust Texan elections, and 40 percent of them trust elections in the rest yeah. of the country. And so I think that, so, so what does that show? One, it might be to what Trey was talking about in, in terms of, you know, single leader saying not to trust elections. Mm -hmm. but, but I also think that there is an opportunity, and this is something we've talked about, for these, these leaders um, to not so doubt in other elections. And I think that there, this is something that we've been trying to do because one could see that there's some advantage to saying, well, we do everything right in this state, but hear about some stuff happening there, or I'm not sure about that state. That doesn't do you any good because you are, uh, you are contributing to challenges that will come back to, to face you. Yeah, um, and yeah. I'll give you an example of the yeah. framework that you can use without knowing the specifics of a state. So one, in, in every state, there's bipartisanship or nonpartisanship baked in. You know, there's Republicans and Democrats, and not necessarily independents in all states, but all of them are there observing. There are testing of voting systems beforehand. They have to comply with federal standards in almost every case. There's opportunities for recounts, and in most cases, there's post-election audits. States have all these things. The courts can weigh in if there's issues, which, of course, creates a problem the right to. But there's a whole lot of standards that are out there that you can point to that are true in every state. And even if you don't know how that election was conducted, if you said that, it would go a l at least a little bit in helping to improve the trust in elections. I, I will quickly follow up on that just to say that um, one thing that I've learned, and that I think attendees of our, of our convenings have hopefully learned as well, is that uh, national level election conspiracies have local impact. Even if the polling shows that folks trust their local elections, we have still seen um, in deep red conservative states pushes for hand counting ballots. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've seen constituents contacting their state legislators and, and their state secretary of state saying, we need to get rid of Dominion voting machines. And they don't even use Dominion voting machines in the state or in that county. Um, there's a lot of confusion out there because people consume media more and more at the national level. So even if they trust their congressman or they trust their local elections clerk, or they, even if they get to the point of volunteering and seeing how elections work at that local level, uh, it's kind of not enough. Uh, to be able to persuade the vast majority of folks who aren't that connected to their local government and who consume news at that national level 
Uh, and so that hopefully is one of those reasons why local uh, trusted figures can recognize the important role that they play, um, even though what they, what these conspiracies are focused on Pennsylvania, Arizona, <laughs> Georgia, yada, yada, it, it boomerangs back onto their local jurisdiction as well. We are just about out of time, so I want this last question to sort of be a, a lightning round. <laughs> what would you like to see in the 2024 20, election, and is there any hope uh, for optimism? Uh, one thing we haven't talked about is the electoral count, electoral count Act reform is helpful because it removes some of the uncertainty and some of the potential for shenanigans uh, that were attempted in 2020 can't really be done in 2024. It's not foolproof, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better. That's a reason to be optimistic. I, I think another reason to be optimistic is just it seems, I mean, partially through the work that we and so many others are doing, there's a lot more proactivity um, now in terms of how can we uh, ensure that there is trust in the elections before the elections happen. And I think that that's what we're trying to do rather than being reactive, which I think is, is what happened in, in 2020 in many cases. To Trey's point around the uh, election administrator's prayer the night before, I want to blow out. Uh, I, I mean, I have maybe some personal preferences about the direction that that goes in, but I, I think the healthiest thing for our country would be an election in which there is no doubt, uh, where the margins are so big mm -hmm. that we, we, can, we can go through for another four-year cycle and put a lot of this to bed. Uh, it's not looking likely, uh, so maybe that's not a reason for optimism, but that's my hope. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us.